Hello, I'm Joshua Unruh, your superhero scholar. Welcome to Superhero University on Captain Marvel, an addendum to Earth's Mightiest Hero. Have a seat. Class is now in session. All right, we are doing something that we have never done on an episode of Superhero University before. We have invited a guest lecturer. Joining me today is Sarah Sentry. Sarah, I discovered you, I think, through Sci-Fi Fangirls and have just enjoyed your work very much since then. And you have recently done some work on Captain Marvel. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I, I wanna give my listeners an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. So please tell me you're a comic book fan, you dive deep, that's what we do here. Just tell, tell my listeners a little bit about Sarah Sentry. Uh, well, I started writing because I just had a big opinion, I guess. <laughs> and there was a uh, just kind of a lot of people being like, well, you sure talk a lot. Maybe you should write something. And I was like a <laughs> teenager at the time. Um, I started doing zines and things like that that were about, you know, uh, pop culture and things like that and how that interacts with uh, identity politics. And eventually I started writing for people like uh, Bitch Media, Auto Straddle, The Establishment, like all of the uh, standard feminist uh, stalwart websites. And um, yeah, it kind of just ended up leading to my job at Sci-Fi. Like I've always been an artist of many different uh, vocations. So I was a musician for a long time. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, basically just kind of got a call from my editor and uh, she was just needing somebody who could write more about deep dive comic book stuff and kind of have a feminist perspective on it. So that was when I started writing. That was a little bit over a year ago. And I've written like 300 articles or something like that <laughs> through them. OK, I don't know that I've read all 300 of those, but <laughs> I uh, but I mean to. <laughs> I mean to, because everyone that I have read, I, I've really enjoyed. And uh, we'll talk more about where you can find all of uh, Sarah's writings. But I have to say, I've read a couple of the zines, and they are also delightful, uh, especially the one about being a lesbian vampire movie. That one is just a delight. Um, Thank you. I, I ran into that and felt like maybe I should just hang it up because I didn't know how to write anything as... Uh, <laughs> as both informative and funny and also very true, you know, <laughs> as, as that piece. So that was a, that was the thing that got me a lot of my work. Once I put out that zine, it was kind of a compilation of a few different articles I had written and it, uh, it got a lot of notice for a zine, which is, was kind of surprising to me. Okay. That one specifically, I will put everything that you mentioned about where people can find you in the show notes, but um, possibly against your wishes or better judgment, I'm going to also include a link directly to that zine because I enjoyed it so much. I hope that that doesn't mean that you're going to throw the table and end this interview now. But, <laughs> no, it's um, great. People are always uh, finding it. It was from years ago and people are still you know, coming at it. And that's why it's online for download is so that, you know, young people, random people, older people, whoever wants to find it can find it. Whoever feels like their life would be improved by literally becoming a lesbian vampire movie uh, <laughs> should read that zine. I mean, that's really the 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 whole point. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so today is the day that Captain Marvel is entering the MCU. It is, uh, I mean, I know I've already seen on my uh, on my Twitter feed people who went to the midnight shows, but the official date is now. I had requests from listeners asking for me to kind of explain some about Captain Marvel. Like she's very out of the blue. In fact, that's some of the, the confusion that I've heard about her entry into the MCU. She's a little bit out of the blue for the MCU also considering kind of where we are in the big like meta plot. And <laughs> And you you can absolutely speak to whether I've made the right decision or not, but I just decided that the cleanest entry point into the version that it looked like we were going to get from trailers was to start with Kelly Sue DeConnick's initial arc on Earth's Mightiest Hero. Uh -huh. And so I did that, and whenever some crazy stuff from her past came up, I did my best to explain it, but it's actually pretty light on crazy stuff from her past other than the origin. Uh -huh. So 
when I read your latest deep dive into Carol and also her costumes on Sci-Fi <laughs> Fangirls, uh, that's why I asked you to come in and just kind of like give that broad sweeping history of Carol Danvers, you know, in 20 or 30 minutes. You know how we do. Yeah. And <laughs> so, so I did. So that's, that's the thing for my listeners. There is a, there, I believe it was two. There was a deep dive article that was just generally about Carol, but also one about her costuming. Am I correct about that? Oh, I've done about 30 articles on Carol Danvers. Okay. Um, then I'm not up. making it up. <laughs> <laughs> leading up like this last year, you know, that's been a huge thing because I think that there's a lot of people who weren't familiar with her uh, comic book history. So it's been definitely one of those characters. Like I liken it to uh, whenever the Wasp movie came out, everybody, the Wasp and Ant-Man movie came out. Yeah. People were so confused at who the Wasp was. And I was like, no, y'all, I got you. Like this has been <laughs> one of my favorite characters for a long time, you know? Uh, and I think that there's a, there's a de-emphasis on a lot of the female characters for a really long time. And it's kind of changing now. So people are just now kind of being like, what? But the characters have been around for like 50 or 60 years. Right. Oh, no, I did the same thing. I mean, you know, I have the same kind of circle of people that are like, so the wasp, you say. And uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I, I understand that completely. I mean, I mean, that's exactly it was the first trailer was when I started getting requests to talk about Carol. And uh -huh. it took me a minute to figure out what tactic I was going to take. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's all over the place. <laughs> like, there's a lot. She really is. And in fact, I mean, I'm going to take one tiny sliver out of the big history just to say that, like, my own personal biggest chunk of Carol that I read was um, in between when she was Ms. Marvel and Binary. And listeners, worry not. Sarah will give you more context for this but when she was really just carol and hanging out with the x-men and didn't remember much and you know that's my biggest chunk uh, uh -huh. of exposure to the character over you know over years uh and then some of her binary because i also love binary probably her best look that isn't a captain marvel look i think oh yeah yeah. yeah, I love binary. I loved that lead up to where she's hanging out with the X-Men kind of going into the brood saga. So good. So let's uh, let's peel it back. Let's start at the beginning. She actually starts out. And I mentioned this in in the the coverage of Ms. DeConnick stuff. Uh, she actually mm -hmm. starts out as a supporting character in the original Marvel Universe Captain Marvel. Mm hmm. And now I have not read all of those and you have. And there is yeah. some discussion as to whether she was an actual love interest for Marvel. And I would like your input. Like, were they heavily played as romantic or less so? Well, that she had to have a motivation for being there. And that was essentially the motivation that she was given because that was the motivation of all female characters in the right, 60s. Right. Was just being like, I'd sure like to talk to that guy. And then just like following him into like deep space by accident or something. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they were they were love interests. He was a lot less interested, it seemed like, than she was. Uh, it kind of is... It reads back weird, definitely, because she definitely believes that they're a love interest. And then he is kind of like, I'm Cree. I'm doing stuff in space. And like, <laughs> it doesn't really seem to dawn on him that much. Um, they've retconned a lot of stuff where you'll be like looking back. They're just like having a picnic on a mesa or something. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Which is completely fabricate. I mean, did not exist in the original run, right? We're no, trying to the, actually make it romantic. <laughs> exactly. And they'll be like, oh, well, he was the only man I ever loved. And it's like, where did that come from? <laughs> like, I mean, I get that you had a crush on him, but like, <laughs> it doesn't seem uh, like there was that much there. But I guess it's been like kind of retconned it that there was it's it's funny to me reading earth's mightiest hero that if you listen to the few times that carol herself talks about marvell mm -hmm. um she almost seems to be downplaying her romantic interest in him yeah. you know like yeah. uh she's retconning her own memories it's kind of great you know <laughs> like uh, uh all these writers came along and gave the gave that relationship all this romantic gravitas and we've reached a point where the character herself is like, ah, let's not, let's just not, 
let's maybe not, you know, it's just not necessary. I think that's probably the conclusion that was, that was came to by everybody on board was like, I mean, if you, if we're going to look at it as a love story, it doesn't read back too good. Like, uh, yes. Well, that's I feel like that's probably true for most of the love interests in the 60s. But this is sure. a particular example, because as soon as she gets powers in a costume, she really splits off on her own and doesn't have that much to do with Marvell anymore. Well, he's in space like he's right. dealing with all of his own problems. There's an issue of the original Miss Marvel series where he comes back and he's kind of like. So it's weird that you're wearing my costume <laughs> and she's just like, isn't it? And they kind of like kiss each other goodbye and go their separate ways. Yeah, right. I mean, yes, there was I should I should say there's an in plot. There's like an in fiction reason for Marvel to not be around. But I uh -huh. think even sort of thematically, right, like one thing I've talked about before is that as Ms. Marvel at the time, uh, was that 1977, 75? That was when the first, it was 77 was 77. when the first series started. So yeah, that initial series in 1977, just naming her Ms. Marvel was like a planting a feminist flag uh, us, using that as the title, right? Because um, Miss Magazine, yeah. Yeah. Gloria Steinem. Right. And then she becomes, Carol becomes an editor of Woman Magazine in, in the Marvel <laughs> Universe, which is... So obviously a 616, you know, Ms. Magazine analog. Yeah. Um, and so the, I don't, I mean, I don't claim to guess whether it was Marvel being out of the picture that said, well, well, then we need to make it, we need to create a reason for her to not need a man around, you know, mm -hmm. or, or if that had always been the plan and the fact that he was in space made that easier. But I mean, that was definitely at that point, like a big, kind of a big break really thematically for her, don't you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and also it was, uh, you know, Claremont was one of, I think it was Jerry Conway wrote the first couple of issues and then yes. it switched over to Chris Claremont, uh, which was definitely for the better. And because like, you know, Conway was great, but not great at writing women at that time. Right. Um, and then, you know, Claremont definitely struggled a little bit, too. He got a lot better once like the X-Men came around. But uh, yeah, it was kind of like it seemed to me like they were being very intentional because at that time, Miss Magazine had, you know, Gloria Steinem's magazine had just got finished uh, really criticizing DC comics for their treatment of Wonder Woman. So you had like uh, that weird plot line where Diana was depowered and became like a ninja or whatever. Well, I mean, she <laughs> became, she became Emma Peel, right? Like essentially, yeah. yeah. Or like, you know, the black canary basically, like she yeah. kind of like took on this like, generic thing and uh yeah Steinem of course and like a lot of women were really upset about that because they were like you know this is our only powerful woman that we have and then Marvel was like oh well we could have <laughs> like a powerful woman too yeah um and so you know obviously their their politics at Marvel at that time were just garbage you know so it's like the fact that that came to be a lot of times like these like female superheroes was basically Stan Lee being kind of like, I don't want someone else to trademark this or something. So that's the She-Hulk story, right? Yeah. That's the She-Hulk story. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like no plot then. So they have like, they're like, uh, so it's just like girl Hulk <laughs> and you're just like, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> Like, what's the story behind Girl Hulk? Then they're like, oh, uh, we don't know the story. We'll just, uh, she's like related to Bruce or something. It's, uh, I think that this may actually be um, a bit of a callback in the Earth's Mightiest Hero story to what you're talking about, you know, 40 years ago, is that uh -huh. Jessica Drew is the friend of Carol's that's checking on all of Carol's stuff while she's lost in time. And uh -huh. Jessica Drew, as Spider-Woman, is definitely another one of those Stan Lee was like, before somebody makes a spider woman, you guys go do it. And then everybody's like, yeah. what's she about though? And the yeah, answer no, is nine struggle. things. Yeah. <laughs> they struggle. That whole spider woman series is just across the board. Like she cries every third panel. Like it's, they don't know what they're doing. It took until uh, like maybe the last like five issues of like a 50 issue series for them to kind of get their, stride and then it was uh over so <laughs> right and then and then we're done well and she also though kind of got like a a resurgence um i mean this has been 15 15 or so years but i mean spider woman's also kind of been a character who got rehabilitated 
by writers who understood the importance of woman superheroes a little bit better, you know? Yeah, she's uh, great. Yeah. She got really interesting. Okay, so if you can give us the high points of Carol's entire history, <laughs> yep. because I feel like my listeners have maybe been giving me some side eye and not entirely believing me when I say things like, no, it's really complicated and you don't need to know all of it for the purposes <laughs> of this movie. And uh, but somebody who's just going to can just come in here and kind of, you know, just give us uh, 40 years, 50 years of of Carol in a brush, I think will give them an idea of that. So I will be quiet and let you do it. Just gush about your character. All right. Oh, geez. Um, so, yeah, we just kind of covered a little bit of it. The yes. whole thing with Carol Danvers. She is an Air Force officer um, that's changed over time, of course. Now we have female fighter pl pilots in the <laughs> real world, so we can have them in comics too. Uh, <laughs> but like in that time period, that was like not even a thing. So she was kind of just running around getting coffee for people, I guess. And uh, Marvel was a total jerk to her all of the time, like said terrible sexist things, just constant terrible behavior from him uh ignored her a lot she tried to like jump in his face a lot and be like i'm a babe and i like you and he's just kind of like i'm serious about space and so uh, they had kind of a weird dynamic and then there was a strange thing where they were on a ship in the middle of somewhere who knows space i guess uh, and he ended up saving her from an explosion and very loosely this is defined as their dna combined whatever that means like while he's carrying her out of an explosion essentially and so then she has the powers of miss marvel that was completely retconned with the life of captain marvel so they decided that she was a kree the whole time like she was born on kree law i think is the name of the <laughs> the kree homeworld um let me, I will help out a little bit because I also have a question here at this point. Sure. But um, yes, the Kree homeworld is Hala, which I feel has grown more ridiculous in recent years, you know, since it's close to both Hala as in, hey, make noise at someone and Hela. <laughs> it's not good either way. It's just kind of bad uh, for yeah. the name of it. But whatever. It's very old. What are you going to do? We never throw anything away in comics. The life of Captain Marvel retcon that you're talking about is pretty recent, though, right? Yeah, that happened just this very last year. That's what I thought. Yeah, I think it was like actually, it might. Yeah, no, it was it was 2018. Um, pretty good series, but very confusing. They kind of like made it a little weirder than it needed to be because she already had such like a dubious origin <laughs> that you're right. kind of like, okay, well, I guess it's cleared up now um <laughs> how like, did you feel about that retcon I, I for for some for some background of why i ask is that deconic makes a big deal about the psychomagnetron being a wish machine which is itself a little bit of a retcon mm -hmm. but that it's like a wish machine with military applications and that in the moment that the explosion happened carol was sort of wishing that she didn't need to be saved wishing that she could help marvel and that it was that wish that like transferred the DNA to her that made her into a Cree hybrid. And mm -hmm. I mean, speaking for myself, I really like that a lot better. I mean, for all kinds of thematic reasons, but also it's the way that they, that's a retcon that just tweaks the idea as opposed to completely rewriting it. And it feels very coincidental to me that her mom would be Cree and she would just happen to meet Marvel. And so yeah. speak to that. how do you feel about that thematically? Like, th does that satisfy you or you kind of wish they'd stop tinkering with it? Well, I was really excited about the life of Captain Marvel, just based on the fact that like, we never really got to see that much of her relationship with her parents. And it was always hinted to be really bad. So like, yeah. I was excited about it, and then it was kind of just like the whole thing got sidelined just to talk about how like her mom is a Cree um, and like a princess, essentially. From what I remember, it was kind of vague, but uh, she ends up coming back to Earth to settle down with the like the worst guy <laughs> that you could possibly settle down with. And so to me, that made no sense. Like 
if you're from another planet, you're doing cool stuff over there. Like, why would you be with this abusive guy who's just a complete misogynist? Um, and I know that that happens in real life, but that's not what I want to see in comics for the most part. Right. These are um, choices, right? Like these are creative choices and you're kind of not yeah. only do you have to make it make sense for the char- the the new character you're writing, Carol's mom, but you also mm-hmm. kind of, I feel like need to be aware of what that's doing to Carol, you know? And it changed her continuity. It also, they kill her mom at the end of the story. So it's like... I don't really know what the point of this was really. Um, and I, I wouldn't even, I mean, it's hard to say with Marvel because a lot of the stuff comes down to like editorial decisions rather than anything that has to do with the creator. So I always try to be very uh, intentional whenever I talk about it to not be like implicating every person and their mom that works for Marvel <laughs> in every single decision that they make. Um, but yeah, it was a weird one. I feel all kinds of ways about it. It's kind of strange. Like I wanted a deeper backstory, but I don't think I got what I wanted out of it. Exactly. Um, The monkey's paw. I wished for something, but not this, you know? Yeah, it was very much like that. And so I'm torn about it. I think that Deconic's reasoning was good. Like the idea of it being kind of wish fulfillment because that's so much of what comics are anyway. So right. that's, to me, that made it make a lot of sense. Uh, and then them retconning is like, I get what they're doing because they're trying to distance Carol from that like damsel background that she had. Uh, but you know, they might not have gone about it the right way. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, it feels like the minute she gets superpowers and says, Oh man, I don't need to be a damsel anymore. And stops being a damsel. I Yeah, like, DeConnick covered it, is mm-hmm. kind of my feel. And for myself, I mean, aside from the coincidence, the comparison I made was uh, was Superman. Like, I've got long-held feelings about the fact that what makes Superman super is not Kryptonian heritage. It's, like, the being a solid guy, which came from mm-hmm. the Kents. And the fact that Carol was good, was like a good person before she was empowered... And then she just became better once she had powers. I like that more. Uh, it's me. Mm-hmm. I have an axe there also to grind, I guess. So. <laughs> and the, uh, I think that they kind of too loosely deal with her childhood abuse story. Like they talk about her being abused, but they're very dismissive about it. And I, um, I just don't like it when that shows up in comics. Like I think that abuse needs to be dealt with. And whenever we see it, it can't just be like, well, that's why she has trust issues with men, you know, or something like that. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah, yeah. That's very dismissive, and I don't enjoy that. (laughs) If you're going to include it, it kind of needs to be what the story is about. Like, you need to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of seem to lessen it a little bit in its impact on her. Like, they're just kind of like, well, he was, like, frustrated because he married, like, a Cree princess, and then it turned out I was just, like, an ordinary woman. And it's like, wow, that's so sad for him. (laughs) Oh, my God. This is getting worse the more you describe it, honestly. Yeah, Um, it's kind of rough. So, okay. So because the the true joy of comic book history is that you can headcanon everything, is that I will just (laughs) ignore that all of that happened and she will just continue to have been empowered by a wish machine. That's for me. I'm going to stay there. Good. It's kind of likely that that'll happen. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Unless this is... Now, Marvel's brand synergy between movies and comic books is uh, hilariously bad. So unless this was some kind of move towards the movie, which I kind of hope it wasn't. Yeah, I think I agree. I I bet this one doesn't stick. But now, so she is Ms. Marvel. She becomes the editor of Woman Magazine. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Like, I've read some of that, but certainly not to the level that you have. And I definitely bring a different eye, you know? (laughs) Yeah, um, well, it's bad, you know, <laughs> like it wasn't going to be good. Uh, it's The magazine's run by J. Jonah Jameson. It's most of the times when he shows up, it's just an excuse for him to say <clears throat> just these like supposedly like backwards things, you know, and then get his like comeuppance or whatever. But the thing is, is that's for men of the 70s to read for their enjoyment so they can feel woke about it. <laughs> right. Be, like, oh, I would never be J. Jonah Jameson. And it's like, cool. Well, some of you are J. Jonah Jameson. And like, when I'm reading a comic book about like a feminist superhero, I don't want to hear this stuff. Like, 
we all hear this stuff. Like, I don't want to hear how, you know, woke Chris Claremont is in 1977 (laughs) because he like isn't J. Jonah Jameson. Um, So it's kind of rough. She works on a staff of like all men, essentially. Like they think that there's like two women that work at Woman Magazine other than Carol. Um, She brings in an older writer woman that she actually like scouts. Like she goes after this woman. But the woman is like suffering from alcoholism and like very vindictive and mean to Carol. Like in her mind, she's always like, well, I'll just be happy to see you fall on your face (laughs) and like all this stuff. So it's kind of like cool, cool mentor there. And that's, that's Tracy Burke you're talking about. That's right. Tracy Burke. Um, And she improves a little bit. Like she ends up becoming the editor of woman magazine whenever Carol is fired. Um, But it's kind of a tough thing to read because that's not really what women's interactions are usually (laughs) like. Yeah. Um, You know, sometimes it is, but it's just, you know, we could have served this purpose better if she wasn't like that. (laughs) Like this could have been a much better comic if she wasn't like that. Um, So it's kind of, once again, it comes down to choices where you're just kind of like, cool, you could have gone a much more interesting direction, but you didn't, it's the seventies, whatever. Uh, Sorry to to interrupt, but I have a question for you about Tracy. Um, Mm -hmm. So I felt like now, again, I don't have nearly the depth of knowledge of their original relationship, uh, but I felt like DeConnick was kind of rehabbing that relationship also. Like they're clearly still kind of antagonistic to one another, but in a, Mm -hmm. I I mean, for lack of a better term, almost a bro way. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we never say nice things to our bros and they still know that we love them. And one thing I picked up on, you can tell me how you feel about this, this pullout, but when they make fun of each other, I I felt like every time they made fun of one another, they were saying things that men would say dismissively, you know, like smile more, you don't Mm -hmm. have a sense of humor. I mean, you know, that kind of stuff. And so for me, not having that, the, the same kind of connection to Carol that, that you do, I felt like that was a pretty solid update without completely ignoring the fact that they didn't really get along originally. Yeah, they had like a little bit of an adversarial relationship. Um, Yeah, that was, I think that the update was great. Like, it was really nice to see, like, because it's, you know, it's not written by a guy. It's not like written by somebody who like, is watching these interactions and the women in his life and being like, oh, women are so catty to each other. It's a woman who's like, there's a lot of complexity to the way that we interact with one another, especially if we have to see each other as professional obstacles, you know? Yeah. Yes. And they were really, I mean, that's definitely feels like a thing Claremont maybe didn't do on purpose, but they really were in competition with one another at the magazine. I mean, Carol would just piss off to do Ms. Marvel things and not tell anybody. And all of a sudden Tracy's Mm -hmm. in charge and. Yeah, definitely. Um, they were in competition or rather Tracy was in competition. (laughs) Yes. Carol was not in competition with anybody. Um, and there, I do want to say too, that there were really good points in that comic, like over the issues, like I'm, Highly critical of it, of course, but like, uh, you know, a lot of the definitive things that we see of Carol going forward are from that comic. Like she doesn't, she doesn't take any, when people condescend to Carol, that is like the worst thing that you could possibly do. Like she tells guys off, like she doesn't settle down on any one guy. She dates like multiple guys through the series. They're all pretty much interchangeable (laughs) Um, and nobody, nobody really bothers her about that part of her life and i think that all of that is good um nobody makes a big deal out of it like people are just kind of like she's a wreck but like for other reasons (laughs) um (laughs) and then she you know she has to struggle like there's like whole parts where like she's dealing with a very unruly staff of guys that just don't respect her and so it's hard and i like that they showed that part you know like that part was good. Like the parts where they kind of give her her own agency and they make her somebody with a temper, like somebody who like just gets tired of things really quickly (laughs) and just leaves. Um, Somebody who like negotiates for a better pay rate, like to J Jonah Jameson while he's like losing his mind, you know, like, 
And everybody else is afraid of Jay Jonah Jameson, and she's not. Like, Peter's afraid of Jay. Like, you know, <laughs> ev- all of these people are afraid of him. And Carol's just kind of like, God, it's this guy again. <laughs> like, <laughs> why does he keep getting in my way? <laughs> You're not wrong. I mean, it's pretty much uh, his publisher, Robbie, and Carol, mm-hmm. and everybody else just lives in mortal dread of Jonah. You are not yeah, wrong. That's, no. that's fantastic. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, that stuff is good. And I mean, I love Robbie, too. But like, oh, yeah, but it's not the same. I mean, it's not the same <laughs> as, you know, Carol. He, no, the paper not. can't run without Robbie. And Carol would be like, I'm sorry, you suck. Fire me if you don't think so. You know, and then they do. <laughs> and then they do. <laughs> like, they give her severance pay. That check is really impressive. Actually, <laughs> they give her like a $2,000 check. And I'm like, whoa, if I got fired tomorrow, I would not get a $2,000. Right. Check. But like, also, okay, let's talk about standards of journalism. But, uh, but they end the series in a really weird way. Like they ended it supposedly with issue 23, but it was planned out and finished to issue 25. So whenever you look on Marvel Unlimited, you'll see it end mid story. And then if you hunt down the issues later, they ended up reprinting the last two issues. And uh, that's kind of where Mystique shows up and you start to see how weird and brutal the like the animosity between those two is um which like you hadn't really seen like mystique was a new character at that time right yeah they had kind of introduced her to be the big foil of miss marvel but then it was like oh the series is over (laughs) your character appeared like twice you know and claremont takes that idea moves her over to the x-men where he has a lot more free range with her um but yeah, so they ended it in a really weird place. So it was kind of, again, as with Spider-Woman, kind of right around the time they started to get their stride, they like ended the series. And um, she ended up going to the Avengers, and then it's just a mess. Like I mentioned this in, mm-hmm. in, in passing. I didn't get way deep into it. And so I'll say it's pretty triggering awful stuff what happens to her at this point in the Avengers so um I already talked a little bit about it honestly as much as I felt like had to so that we could continue you can go into as much or as little of that as you like because it's pretty terrible and gross and I don't want you to feel like you have to give the blow by blow oh of course and I I wouldn't want to I've done some writing on it there's also pieces uh Stephanie Williams did a piece that was just covering the details of the story and how it's aged and that's that's a really good piece I read that piece it is very good and it will so yeah listeners maybe go do that if you really want to it's bad it's just a variety of terrible choices Essentially, she's raped. Like, we can say that, I guess. Yes. Like, essentially, she's sexually assaulted by this guy. Um, the Avengers let her go off with him after he's brainwashed her. Uh, she's traumatized. The only way she ends up escaping that situation is that he rapidly ages to death. Um, so if it were up to the Avengers, she would probably still be in deep space with this guy. So she comes back to Earth pissed. Um, deservedly so. Yeah. And... Yeah. Uh, what I will say is is that that is an important story for feminist comics criticism because there was a woman named Carol Strickland who wrote a piece that was called The Rape of Miss Marvel, which you can still find online. Mm-hmm. And that is a, an epic piece of criticism. I think it came out in like 1980 around the same time of the story and nobody was talking about this stuff at the time. And Carol Strickland brings up a lot of the details of the story and says, wow, this is so messed up. I can't believe you guys let this in a comic. Um, and Chris Claremont read that article and was like, wow, you're right. You know, that sucks. And he wasn't the one to write that story. That was Jim Shooter. We can blame and hate Jim Shooter as much as we want, but Claremont didn't have anything to do with that one. And then he wrote the story of Avengers annual number 10, where Rogue and Mystique attack Carol on her return to earth after she was just like raped and traumatized. Rogue absorbs her power and like puts her into a coma so just trauma after trauma the avengers come to visit her at a certain point after she's been working with professor x just to be able to regain her uh like faculties basically um and she tells the avengers off and it's great (laughs) i think that happened because of feminist comics criticism so that's awesome 
Um, That's a metatextual point that is fantastic. I mean, we would all prefer that the original story hadn't happened, but the idea that Claremont read that piece about the terrible story and realized, oh yeah, this is all bad. I'm going to make sure that I write an indictment of that story and put it in Carol's mouth because that's where it should come from. Um, yeah, is great. Yeah, that's strong. It is. And also it just means something too for him going forward. Like his work with Carol got much more interesting. So then <laughs> we have <laughs> him brood saga leading into that. Carol hangs out with the X-Men. You were talking about this part. Like they kind of become bros. Like she knew Wolverine back when, but a lot of her memories are gone. Same as Wolverine's. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I mentioned she's also kind of a fo foil's probably not the right word, but she like Wolverine doesn't like Rogue already, I guess. And Carol mm -hmm. is a really good reason to turn the animosity between different factions of X-Men up two or three more notches, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, you would, too, if somebody had attacked your friend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like... You know, but then like we there's that famous scene where they pan over to Rogue and they say, I don't think she's going to hurt anybody. And Rogue is like a sobbing mess in the corner, you know, <laughs> and it's just like, yeah. And then, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation around maybe a lot of what turned into Rogue's personality is Carol, you know. Yes, um, that's yeah. But, but we can never say we don't really know. <laughs> like that's up to whatever writer is working on the title. Um but then, so they go to outer space somehow, randomly. Well, oh, we should talk about the Pentagon thing, too. Like, she goes into the Pentagon, and she deletes her entire identity. So, like, she gets rid of all of the Miss Marvel files, all of the Carol Danvers files. So there's that. Then they go to space. She, all of the X-Men are experimented on by the brood. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, like, really great character beats. Storm turns into a space whale for a little while. <laughs> Like, the brood saga, like all of that stuff is just bonkers and amazing. Like everybody wants to talk so about good. the Dark Phoenix saga, but that's really, I'm just, for me, the most pure X-Men that you can have is the brood saga. We're in space. Why? I don't know. We're being experimented <laughs> on. What is that causing? Character conflict, you know? <laughs> yeah. Wolverine might have to kill everybody. Uh, Kitty Pride, whenever she finds the costumer and she's like <laughs> switching costumes like the whole time. Yes. And everybody's like, girl, we're about to die. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, but I'm 14. And also I'm trying to hack their computer system. <laughs> and it's like, wow. See, when people don't understand why Kitty's great, I'm always like, brood saga, read that. Yes, she's great. absolutely. Yeah. It's like, this is why we all loved this girl. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, she goes into space. She's separated from the X-Men. They know that she's not an X-Man, so they separate her and they experiment on her. She becomes binary, which means that she has the power of a white hole, whatever that means. That's um, literally what it means. It's like, whatever you need, we got it. You know? <laughs> yeah. It means she turns red and has like fire motif and also a really rad white Dave Cockrum <laughs> designed outfit for years. So that happens. Uh, and then she kind of just quits everything. Like she quits Earth. Like she's done. She doesn't like the Avengers anymore. <laughs> she doesn't like the X-Men. They like are friends with Rogue now. She When she finds them being friends with Rogue, she beats the hell out of Rogue. She like knocks her into space almost. And uh, they have this huge conflict. She just kind of tells Professor X off, which he always deserves um, <laughs> that's a, that's like, a very useful footnote. Professor X always deserves to be told off. He's the worst. Yeah, never is there a time when he does not deserve it. But um, so she goes out into outer space and she is gone. Like we don't really hear from her. She pops up in Quasar sometimes. Like that checks out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Nineties Quasar is bonkers. But like, yeah, she kind of pops up in that. Then uh, Operation Galactic. Galactic Storm, Operation Galactic Storm starts. And it is a sprawling mess of a crossover across the Avengers and cosmic Marvel titles. So not, not even going to try to explain it, but essentially what happens is she ends up being depowered and is now no longer binary. So we see her come back. She joins the Avengers a few years later as Warbird. 
Um, <laughs> which like, I just, I have to question so much because it's a uh, Kurt Busaic is the person who writes her whenever she comes back to Marvel, whenever she returns to the Avengers in like 1999, I think. But it's not great. Like it's she's kind of mystifying. It's legitimately a giant question mark to me how this happened. Yeah, because it's like this is somebody who we like. <laughs> like you <laughs> say, is good. Like he writes a lot of good stuff. We all make mistakes though, and uh, yeah, he brings her back, and she's like immediately suffering from alcoholism. But there's so little context around it that it just really makes her not come across well because it's just kind of like, well, everybody else is fine, but she's not fine, you know? And like, why can't she like get her stuff together kind of? And that's like just such a terrible, uh, just a terrible message to send, I guess, for alcoholics, for Carol, for everybody. Well, I mean, look at her history too. Like the answer is right there before you. You don't have to short shrift the question of why is she in a tough spot? She's had yeah. power. She's been depowered. She's been uh, sexually assaulted. Her friends didn't stand up to her. Then she made new friends. Those friends sided with the next person that assaulted her. I, it's it's not hard Seriously. to pin down. <laughs> no. And then that was, and she was in space with like the star jammers having adventures for years and then comes back to like less power, you know, more pressure, like. Uh, sorry, asterisk. Space, star jammers are space pirates that usually hang out with the X-Men listeners. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a really good uh, two parter that's like X-Men spotlight on star jammers that has binary in it. And that's kind of one of her better appearances because they do kind of just write her out of the comics like she doesn't show up for a long time. But yeah, the whole thing with Warbird is really weird. Uh, she goes through treatment, apparently. We don't really see it. <laughs> like, uh, she just kind of has an alcohol problem. She shows up and is like, does some really embarrassing stuff in a few issues of Wolverine and then is just gone again, but then comes back with no problems. And is it just is weird. I, I hate the name. I hate the outfit. I hate the alcoholism yeah. out of nowhere. It's not, yeah. the, it is possibly. I mean, again, my, my knowledge is not as deep as yours. That feels like the nadir. That's the worst time. Yeah, for this because character. they don't know what they're doing with her. <laughs> like, they're just like, well, this is a character. I bet she's like, it's like, oh man, just like the negative connotations that they're giving a survivor of abuse and trauma is like bad. You know, like they're saying, like, just uh, the dismissiveness, I think, is just really gross and upsetting and it's not just the one creator because she appeared in a lot of guest spots across titles mm -hmm. at that time and uh yeah it just gets worse and worse like eric larson's take on that was gross and like just bad um so yeah i don't know it was like one of those times where it was just like wow it really have just kind of been better if carol wasn't in these comics <laughs> and i feel weird saying that because she had just had such a stint of not being in comics um, and I wanted to see much more of her as binary. Like that was like, you know, that's a huge miss opportunity if you like look back at her uh, time. But then she joins the Avengers. She's the leader of the Avengers for a little while uh, by written by uh, Brian Michael Bendis and um, has some weird interpersonal stuff with Wonder Man and just like, I, it's like there's they still just don't really seem to know what they're doing with her for a while. I, and I'll say it for myself, Brian Michael Bendis is a writer who either nails it or just miffs it hard. Like there's, I, agree. I don't live in an in-between space with him. I either love the thing or I'm just like, did you ghost, who, did you get a ghost writer? Was it just somebody else showed up that day? It's yeah. And this was yeah. one of the latter, I feel not the yeah. best time, you know? Yeah, it's like, it starts strong. Like, we think we're going to see Carol, like, in a leadership role. But then it's like, she's being catty with the wasp. And, like, you just see all this kind of, like, you know, stuff. And, like, meanwhile, he really nailed the wasp. Like, that was a great characterization. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> but, yes. But it's like, but Carol was so off, like, the whole time. And just very, like, kind of vindictive towards other women again. Like, we started seeing this, like weird sides of her, I guess. Um, 
But, like, yeah, she ends up, like, just not making that much sense. They get kind of sidetracked with everything. Like, they do her, like, weird relationship drama a lot. And then, uh, you know, none of it matters. (laughs) And then (laughs) a secret invasion happens, and she finds out that her best friend, Jessica Drew, has been a scroll for a while. Um, And that's, you know, shattering, I'm sure. Uh, and she makes kind of friends with this, like, Captain Marvel, like, scroll, which is a little strange, but I guess makes sense for her character arc. Like, she's looking for some catharsis. This is a scroll pretending to be the original Marvel. Yeah. Because we have had, it's worth saying, and we're not going to talk about them because there's a lot of them and most of them don't have much to do with Carol, but there have been several other Captains Marvel in the interim. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> so For my money, the best one's going to be Monica Rambeau, but, like... You know, everybody's mileage is going to vary. On I that agree one. with that. I feel like there was a moment when Novar could have been amazing, but mm-hmm. I feel like Novar is uh, the his original appearance in Marvel Boy and his time in Young Avengers, notwithstanding. Every other time you see Novar, it's always like that's about to be good, and then it isn't. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he's kind of like a fuck boy. <laughs> like you're just like, why is this guy here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. <laughs> He's here because, like, Kate Bishop needs somebody to make out with that is an America Chavez because, like, that they can't let that happen. So, um, he does. Well, okay. I'm not going to go down a crazy Novar rabbit trail. I feel like he winds up in a less why are you here t- space with Young Avengers. Like, almost that was the plan. But nevertheless, sure. that's well after he was being Captain Marvel. So it has nothing to do with this. I apologize <laughs> for even bringing it up. She makes friends with Scroll <laughs> Captain Marvel. <laughs> Yes. Um, Secret Invasion ends. That scroll dies. Everybody dies. Yes. <laughs> All the scrolls die. Um, Wasp dies for about as long as it takes to go to the supermarket. Um, <laughs> she's gone for, you know, 20 minutes. Um, just a lot of... That's another Brian Michael Bendis story where it's like, all right, bud. Um, <laughs> gotcha. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So after Secret Invasion, we have Dark Rain, right? Pretty much it's that sequence, I guess. We leave out a bunch of stuff, but the important stuff, we go from Secret Invasion to Dark Rain. Norman Osborn's in control of the Avengers. Everything's, you know, the the edgelord version of its <laughs> former self. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it, which is not, a, I feel like is not a terrible idea, but also just goes on way too long. Way too long. Yeah, and it's a, it, with... With so many of these stories, it's like, that's a cool idea for, like, four issues, uh-huh. and then they, like, completely lose their this focus. This was years. Nobody seems to know. Yeah, nobody knows what point they're making anymore. Like, they're just like, yeah, like, these guys are heroes, but they're, like, evil or whatever. And it's like, cool. That's very profound. We did it in Thunderbolts better than this. Why are we doing this again? Yeah, it's like, cool. Wow, the Thunderbolts are still here. That's so weird. <laughs> like... <laughs> So, yeah, actually, the Thunderbolts, like uh, Moonstone from the Thunderbolts, like Carla Sofen, um, ends up becoming one of the uh, one of these Dark Avengers or whatever. Um, And she ends up like taking on the Miss Marvel, like whatever it is, like guys or whatever. She's wearing the original Miss Marvel outfit. Uh, She is pretending to be a hero like all of the rest of the terrible Avengers are. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, they think that Carol Danvers is dead. Uh, Carol Danvers just comes back and beats the hell out of Moonstone and takes her name back, which is pretty great. Like, that Miss Marvel series rant, I think for, like, 50 issues, it's pretty, like, doesn't go anywhere for a long time, and then all of a sudden, it's really good, <laughs> because you have, like, <laughs> it's a theme. Carol... Yeah, totally. Like, Carol's mad all of a sudden, and it gets really interesting. Like, she has an actual nemesis in Moonstone, you know? Like, usually she's just kind of fighting other people's villains. And, like, you know, Moonstone's been around forever, so she's everybody's villain, kind of. But, like, (laughs) wow. That, like, that showdown between those two is great. And then, uh, you know, five issues later, the series ends. (laughs) Um... (laughs) But those, they're good issues. Like, it seems, once again, like, it finally finds its footing um, and then just is over. 
Uh, and then after that, it is pretty much just into the Deconic run, mm-hmm. I think. So I think we finally have made it to the end of this long, convoluted story. And 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 even there, though, I mean, again, I, I may cover the I've covered the first part of Earth's Mightiest Hero. And I and I feel like after the movie blows everybody's minds, there's going to be requests for more. So we can just touch on the fact that even within Deconic stuff, there's almost two different eras right there. Um because you have yeah. Earth's Mightiest Hero, where she's kind of like, I-, I keep referring to it as a rehab and refurbish, because it's not like we threw away everything that was Carol. We were just like, can we just take the edges off and maybe actually do some, you know, fix this? Uh, all the pieces What would happen here. if somebody who liked this character wrote her? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then after that is the case for a while, and then I'm not even sure where Civil War II falls because it's garbage. Trash. Pure trash. Don't read it. Ignore it. And then she goes to space, and it's like Carol on more. It starts out Carol on her own, you know, Star Trekking basically. Mm-hmm. And so even within yep. Deconic stuff, there's kind of these two, uh, not versions because they very much interlock. Like uh, uh, her going off to space on her own is very much a uh, higher, further, faster, more. I'm the Avenger for this job. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, but yes, that brings us more or less. Um, current and so i feel like you've probably spoken to this somewhat with your with your comment about what if somebody who enjoyed this character wrote them but i i take it you feel largely positive about deconic's rehab of the character yeah i really do um i think that it's great i think that she does a great job she was an air i believe she, she had family that was in the air force and so you kind of see this return to that mm-hmm. a little yeah. bit yeah um, yeah, she is really self-empowered. You see that, like, uh, that kind of hesitance to settle down whenever she's with James Rhodes, but they have a really good relationship in this, <laughs> like in Civil War Two, it's really bad, but in this, it's really good. Um, and then, yeah, you get to, we get to be introduced. I mean, Chewie existed before and Chewie is goose in the movie, of course, but, uh, we got to see her with her cat in space hanging out with like all of the other people like she hangs out with a4 she hangs out with guardians of the galaxy she's in the ultimates for a little while like alpha flight like she's really interacting with the marvel universe in a way that we have never seen um so that's really good and i also wanted to make a note that it's not two parts it's three parts because there's the first part then there's the carol core that oh, you're right. The, yes. The battle world thing. Of course. So. Of course. Oh, my gosh. Well, because battle world. OK, I, I mean, my listeners come to me for this stuff. OK, but just know <laughs> that this is this is what I'm talking about. Like these huge battle world is its own giant thing we would have to explain yeah. to get to why the Carol Corps is cool. So, you know, add us on Twitter, I guess. And we'll. <laughs> yeah. or, Sarah's that's probably series. written about this already. So <laughs> not yet, actually. But uh, the Carol Core series, if you have like, you know, an hour of your time to read one story, that is a good story. It's true. It doesn't have anything to do with continuity, but check it but out. But you're right. There are um, literally three different mini eras. Like they're too short for me to say eras, but they really are like different takes on very much the same character, you know. Yeah, and I think that they were kind of testing the waters with that first one. Like, we didn't think that that was going to succeed, right? Like, that was uh, 2012, I believe. Yes. Kelly Zuda Connick was, like, doing her own promotion for it. Right. (laughs) She had to, like, pay out of pocket to promote that book, you know? Like, she's pretty much the reason that we know who Captain Marvel is at this point. I recall her tweeting a few months ago that she was like, remember when we all had to make our own Captain Marvel swag because none of it existed in stores, you know? Right. Yeah. And then you see the the real life Carol core, like the fans of Carol who, uh, you know, really rallied around the book. So that was interesting stuff. Again, this is like the women who are outside of comics having this effect on Carol's trajectory is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a really good insight. It's true. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, so can I assume that you are excited for the movie? Yeah, I'm going to go see it later today, <laughs> seven p.m. I expected it. I was just, I'm just checking, you know. And what? <laughs> so again, you've got this long length and breadth of you know knowledge about this character, about Carol Danvers. What part of this 
long story history do you most hope to see in the movie? And I mean plot or character. And I think we kind of know some of the plot, but I think you and I probably are both very interested to see what they do with that because so much of it just is not jive with the MCU, you know. But what's the yeah. thing you're most hoping to see in there? I guess, honestly, I'm just kind of hoping that we get a good look at Carol and who she is, yeah. you know? And that seems to be what the focus of the movie is. I kind of just think that she has been so across the board and it's been very, like, scattered that all they can really do is go the Kelly Sue DeConnick direction and be like, here's what makes her cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of just what I'm looking for. Like, I want to see space fights. I want to see her, like, go binary, you know? Like, I want to see all that stuff. But, you know, they only have two hours to tell the story. So, oh, and Goose, of course. I want to see the cat. Sure, of course. That's a month. I have cats. I love her for being the superhero that has cats. (laughs) I think I agree with you in that all they can really do, all they really should do is just be like, try and get everybody on the train of Captain Marvel because you should be, right? Like, however Mm -hmm. you get there, however you onboard at whatever era or, or whatever you should be here now, you know um, I've actually heard some oh. kind of pushback from MCU fans. No, not a lot of comic book background who are like, but why is she here now? Like, it just feels like we're introducing her so she can punch Thanos. And I was like, that's a feature, not a bug, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Punch Thanos. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And I, uh, also her friendships. I wanted to say that she's always yes. a really good friend the friendships that they seem to be building towards are going to be really good. I'm all excited about the Samuel Jackson interactions. Like that's something that's really important with Carol too, that we forget about a lot is, is that she is friends with so many people in Marvel. And so you get to see these really great dynamics. Yeah, that's good. I pulled a little bit of that out of that first arc uh, from DeConnick where she is the only person who can tell Captain America what to do. And he just does it like without looking. And, and then She's able to joke with Spider-Man, but also in a way that Spider-Man's like, but also please don't murder me, you know, and that's before (laughs) we get to, you know, Tracy and a lot of interaction with uh, Helen's memory and later Helen herself. But um, yeah, the friendships are and Jessica Drew shows up and you just believe it like you just I don't have a huge connection with those two characters. And I just believed it right away. I was like, oh, of course, these two characters get along. Of course, they're friends, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It makes perfect sense for her and Jessica Drew to be friends. Like they are both so weirdly treated. Right. There's like a meta reason for them to be friends as well as all these in character reasons. (laughs) Yeah, totally. All right. Well, Sarah, I really appreciate you taking this bullet for me and and really like, because I (laughs) I would have been at this for another three months before I could have done that boil down that you did. Uh, So I, I, um, and just the affection that you have for the character comes through and I have kept you so much longer than I said that I would. And I really appreciate your time. So please tell all of my listeners, where can people find you, your work? What should they be on the lookout for right now? You know, in the near future, what, whatever you want to tell them, tell them. All right. Uh, well, I am on Sci-Fi Fangirl, so I am doing tons of pieces for them all of the time. I've been doing tons of pieces. If you look at the archive, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Always trying to break things down from kind of a more feminist perspective, I guess. Uh, And then this month, they're doing every single day of Women's History Month. We focus on a woman who has been forgotten, who did a ton of work for genre. Uh, Today's episode is going to be Mindy Newell. It's a podcast. I should probably mention that. Uh, The episode for today is going to be Mindy Newell. And I did the uh, script for it. Um, Mindy Newell was the first woman to write Lois Lane and also Catwoman and is the first credited woman to write Wonder Woman. So, uh, yeah, basically for the rest of the month, there's going to be a podcast every single day to check out. That's fantastic. So I would say that's, that's the immediate future. I will definitely be listening to the Mindy Newell episode. Lois Lane is no lie. One of my top five characters in superhero comics. Um, she is fantastic. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's hard. It's hard for me to do actual top fives, but she's, she's always up there. And I have to say top five because she's jockeying around. Like it just depends. Anyway, nobody wants to hear my wild top five story. So that's great. So sci-fi fangirls, 
I know that, that you and I have had the pleasure, I like to think, of interacting on Twitter. Would you like people to be able to follow you on Twitter? Yeah, it's just at Sarah Century, no H. Very good. Yeah, sarahcentury.org. Very good. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much for being here, Sarah. I really appreciate you. Uh, you just did for me what I'm usually doing for my listeners, and that is awesome. I really thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this addendum to the sessions of Superhero University on Captain Marvel, Earth's Mightiest Hero. Once again, special thanks to Sarah Sentry for making an appearance on this episode and really just unpacking all the amazing things that are Carol Danvers. If you have any other questions or input, you can find me easily enough on Twitter. I'm at Joshua Unruh, and the hashtag is SHU Marvel. Please remember that Superhero University is a Pulp Diction Productions program and is 100% supported by listeners like you. To find out how you can keep this and our other shows in production, check out patreon.com slash Pulp Diction Productions. And if you can't support us financially, make sure to leave a glowing review at Apple Podcasts or tell all of your friends. Thank you again for joining me for this session of Superhero University, and we'll see you back here next time. Until then, class is dismissed. <laughs>